You might think latex gloves or the mattress you love are modern inventions, but that's not true. The stuff that makes them has been around for a crazy long time, over 3,500 years. We're talking about ancient civilizations tapping trees to get this milky sap. Fast forward to today and latex is everywhere. Each year, more than 12 million tons of natural rubber is produced. But how does this gooey tree sap turn into all these awesome things? Let's dissect the science behind it. We know that latex is like a microscopic party inside water. Tiny polymer particles are suspended, the key ingredient for making rubber. But where does this come from? For that, we'll have to travel halfway across the globe. Believe it or not, our latex journey started way back in the 11th century. The people of Central and South America weren't wearing raincoats just yet, but they were using rubber, a close relative of latex. They coated fabrics with it and even made balls for games. It all starts with the seeds. There's a special kind of tree called the Hevia brasiliensis, also known as the rubber tree. This bad boy produces a milky white liquid called natural latex. They're pampered in a nursery for a year and a half, then given a bud graft from a better tree. After a trim, they join other hopeful trees on a plantation where they'll be cared for six to seven years. So we know all about where natural latex comes from, but what about the other kind? Let's enter the world of synthetic rubber. Synthetic rubber is a human-made version that's cooked up in a lab. There are two main ingredients, styrene and butadiene, and both come from a precious source of energy, petroleum. But just like natural latex has different variations, synthetic rubber can be customized too. Scientists can create types of rubber that resist chemicals and high temperatures. Now that the rubber trees are all grown up, it's harvest time. But instead of plucking fruit, there's another task. A skilled tapper needs to perform a delicate trick. Using a special knife, they carefully shave a precise slanted cut into the bark, releasing the white liquid. It's all about finding the perfect balance. Too deep a cut and the tree gets hurt, too shallow and we miss out on valuable latex. This latex then travels down a specially designed channel cut alongside the initial slash, all the way to a spout at the bottom. It flows right into a waiting cup for collection. But this isn't a one and done deal. Every other day, the tapper returns wielding their special knife again. This time, they make a thin shaving right below the previous cut, creating a ladder-like pattern on the tree. As the trees reach a certain height, it's time to change it up. The other side of the tree gets tapped, giving the first side a chance to heal up. It's a bit of a slow process. Each tapping takes about three hours and yields less than a cup of latex. Remember, latex starts to solidify pretty quickly on its own. To keep it flowing freely for collection, the tappers add a special ingredient like ammonia to the cup. Finally, both the liquid and the collected clumps get whisked away to factories where the real transformation happens. Once collected, the latex sap begins its journey to become the useful latex products we know. First, it goes through a series of processing steps to remove impurities and prepare it for further treatment. It's strained to remove large particles. In some cases, it goes through centrifugation, a high-speed spinning process that separates the heavier rubber particles from the watery serum. Next, antioxidants and other additives are mixed in to improve the latex's properties and shelf life. These additives can help prevent the latex from degrading and make it more durable for its final use. You've got your latex ready to go, but it's still a bit like sticky milk. Back in the 1800s, Charles Goodyear discovered the process of vulcanization. Rubber was great, but it had a major weakness, temperature. Get it too hot and it turned all gooey, too cold and it became stiff and brittle. Not exactly what you want for a reliable material. This game-changing process involved heating rubber with sulfur, making it way more elastic and resistant to both hot and cold. Since vulcanization causes chemical bonds to form within the latex, rubber's good to go in all sorts of weather now. Sometimes the latex needs to be even stronger. It's time to extract concentrated rubber. This step uses specific methods to separate the valuable rubber particles from the remaining water. Machines use strong spinning to fling out water, leaving behind concentrated rubber. Or a special chemical is added that makes the rubber particles puff up and float to the top. It's then skimmed off, leaving behind concentrated rubber. The latex is ready to take shape. It's poured into different molds depending on the use. A car tire mold is massive, while a mold for a tiny rubber band needs to be super precise. Whether it's gloves, balloons, or even mattresses, latex can be molded to fit anything. 
High pressure is applied once the mold is filled, ensuring every nook and cranny gets filled perfectly. Then, depending on the product, heat or special chemicals might be used to solidify the latex and set it in its final form. So where do we use all this rubber, natural and synthetic? Well, the biggest rubber fan by far is the tire industry. A massive 60-70% to 70 of all rubber goes into those trusty tires that keep your car rolling. But rubber's reach goes way beyond your wheels. Think about those comfy shoes you love, the conveyor belts that keep factories running smoothly, or even the fan belt in your car that keeps things cool. Yep, all packed with rubber. Rubber is also a champion when it comes to hoses, flooring, and even cables. It's everywhere. And remember those latex gloves we talked about earlier? Well, those are actually made directly from natural rubber latex. Before the final products hit the shelves, there's one last barrier. They have to pass rigorous quality checks to ensure they meet industry standards. This includes testing for strength, flexibility, and resistance to wear and tear. The latex products need to be perfect and perform at their best, or else there might be some major consequences. With quality assurance complete, it's time to package up the freshly made latex goods. Whether it's a box of gloves or a bag of balloons, each item is carefully packed to protect it during transit and storage. These products fill your local stores and are transported to factories, homes, and offices. It's amazing to think about the journey that these products have taken, from humble latex sap to finished goods ready for use. But with the growing population and usage, the world needs more products than natural rubber trees can handle. Today, most rubber is synthetic, but both sides are innovating. In 2022, the synthetic rubber market was valued at 23 billion US dollars. And with new technology on the horizon, it's only bound to go up. Scientists are creating improved natural rubber varieties, while synthetic rubber gets cheaper, faster, and finds new uses. And there you have it, the journey of how latex is made. Who knew that a rubber duck could have so much effort put into it? So if you enjoyed learning about this process, keep your eyes peeled for the next one on our channel. Thanks for watching.